Um, yeah, it's first of all, it's, it's really wonderful to to see you. And uh, as we already heard now, we joined from various different places with very various different time zones. So it's always nice to see um, everybody and you know that, that you all stay engaged. And in this session, what we plan to do is kind of to to show what we did um, during uh, this network. We are all, almost, you know, approaching, you know, the last months. It will continue, I think, until um, April. We got a little extension due to COVID, uh, as we couldn't spend also all the resources during COVID. So um, that was very nice. And um, yeah, in, in the evening meeting, you will hear, of course, much more about the, the organizational things. And, and now it's really to to um, yeah to report on the different working groups. And this is. Um, working group three and four, if I'm not confused, because it has changed, but I think that would be the, the right order. Okay, so let me um, share some slides and go right into um, the presentation. And talk about um, contestation. Um, and, and I think it's nice before we um, before we um, before we go into, into those more theoretical concepts to kind of revisit the starting point. And when we prepared this action, we had a, a meeting where already several, um, and some of you are here now, a joined for, for meeting and we did kind of a brainstorming and we thought on the one hand, what are important political developments um, at the moment um, uh, that relate to foreign policy of the European Union? And also how does this then, um, um, impact on on more theoretical notions how we study EU foreign policy and and so many things already at the time where were in flux so there was already a lot of talk on the decline of the liberal uh, order of geopolitical change there were already de um, important developments um, in the European neighborhood and over the action of course things have um, even become um, uh, far more pronounced uh, of course um, What's on everybody's mind now is, is Russians, um, Russia's invasion uh, of Ukraine, um, but but also of course uh, the COVID pandemic and and all these things. So, so there were a lot of challenges um, that really I think also on a more theoretical um, level um, will shape in the years to come um, how we um, study and look at EU foreign policy. Think about things like um, you know um, how we looked at interdependence so long as something that's uh, largely positive and, and you know connects the world probably makes it even more peaceful and now we think far more in vulnerabilities and have um, a, a much more cautious um, approach i think to it and and um, uh, i think you see this with um, with many concepts now you see that we looked a lot at uh, europeanization um, uh, for example in terms of promoting eu norms and values and, and at the moment, we also think, well, uh, to what extent is uh, the European Union influenced by the outside and uh, from this information to, to many other things. So I think perspectives are, are far more less um, only uh, looking to the uh, outside. Um, but uh, that was one thing that we observed, so many changes in the international environment of the European Union, but at the same time also um, that the European Union has to deal with all these challenges at a time where we had Brexit, still a lot of ramifications from the financial crisis, the migration crisis, the rise of the populist right, um, recent elections, again, uh, France, Italy, no point that these are things that are here to stay. And that, of course, raised also the question, how can the um, EU foreign policy system deal with those two um, simultaneous developments? So um, greater internal um, contestation um, of certain EU position and norms, but also, of course, um, all that in a very challenging um, geopolitical um, environment. And, and this is just, you know, to, to remind me that, uh, you, you know, when, when we look at the traditional Europeanization literature, you have a literature on the one hand, now that looks a lot at, at norm promotion, also in a way it relates to these normative power Europe arguments. And, the, you know, one thought a lot about different methods to uh, or, or, or pathways to spread EU norms and values and one thought a lot about Europe as a kind of a model for um, a more rule governed um, um, and world um, more based on international institutions um, and, and I think that has changed quite a bit over our recent years um, and at the same time uh, internally uh, for a long time I think um, uh, those applying uh, notions like Europeanization 
question or thinking about the relevance of EU norms, um, a lot um, related to uh, how can we explain growing convergence between EU member states, or how can we explain that despite uh, such an intergovernmental mode, like in the common foreign and security policy, we still see quite um, some um, um, notable um, results, uh, despite uh, the hurdles of uh, policy making in this uh, system and such a constrained um, mode of policy making. So, so Europeanization was on the one hand in its external dimension of um, making the world look more like the European Union, um, and and internally um, uh, a lot about convergence of of member states and the impact of Europe on the member states and maybe also their contributions to shaping um, uh, Europe. So, so here you can see um, this kind of three dimensions that one studied. Um, so one looked on the one hand how the member states shape uh, Europe also in line with their own priorities, how they then adapted to Europe, and also how individual member states um, through socialization and other processes of cross-loading influenced each other in, in, in subgroups. Um, that's uh, um, a literature I think that now uh, takes up some steam again that, that one looks at a subgroup uh, cooperation and there's interesting work on this horizontal uh, dimension. Um, and, and what we then did in the in the project where we looked at um, what are key indicators of Europeanization, and then we asked ourselves the questions, um, can you um, not also uh, kind of look at the reverse side? So if we want to understand um, and think about slide one, how Europe got more as a foreign policy system under pressure both from the inside and from the outside, um, can we use um, Europeanization as a kind of an indicator to measure potential changes in the other direction. Just like if you study democratization, you can also study de-democratization. So wouldn't those indicators also provide us um, with interesting information if there is a regress from previous accomplishments of Europeanization, be it in terms of accumulated and established common positions, um, but also um, in terms of uh, a growing contestation of uh, established um, EU norms. Um, so um, um, apart from you know, those elements, there were also works on Europeanization that applied probably more kind of a public administration and organizational frame. And they looked at how do foreign ministries change uh, as part of the process of Europeanization, how do organizational units change the training of diplomats, but also the diplomatic culture within foreign ministries. And again, all this is interesting to study when one looks, for example, at the rise of populism and, 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 and those internal drivers, potential drivers of the Europeanization, but also how do you um, respond to a changing international environment in which Europe is probably less central um, to some member states, um, at least. So, so in, in one um, um, special issue that uh, our working group um, did, and uh, I co-edited it with um, Ben Tondra and also Karolina Promoska, we, we first tried to define um, de-Europeanization, and we argued that it's um, pretty much the, 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 the mirror image um, of Europeanization. So we looked at um, situations um, where previous accomplishments of foreign policy, Europeanization become challenged, undermined, or even reversed. Um, this definition differs a little bit because we, um, you know, we have different perspectives in the literature. Some argued that whatever you upload to the um, EU level, even if it is competing with established norms, that can be called um, Europeanization. And we took more a uh, a kind of a normative approach arguing well you know we all got accustomed that Europeanization is identified with um, certain norms and values and when these norms and values erode then um, one could speak um, of the Europeanization and we identified different drivers of the Europeanization um, and uh, internal drivers and external drivers and again they already relate to the slide one where we um, mapped the international environment and what's happening in the European Union. And, and then we applied this to different um, case studies. And some of you are here now. I looked at uh, uh, Antonio, now you, you, you had the, the chapter now uh, jointly uh, on Greece and Portugal. Um, and of course, Carla now with, with Italy. And, and we had several countries and, and we looked, you know, what is happening. Um, and then we had a very nice chapter, I think, uh, from Mike Smith and one from um, 
um, from uh, Daniel Thomas, where they looked more generally at trends of the Europeanization. What does it mean for foreign policy making? And, and Mike Smith, what does external uh, influence mean for for the Europeanization? So if you look into the special issue, you will see that you know we we identified um, um, core elements of the Europeanization and indicators how to to measure it um, and to relate to the deconstruction of professional roles, um, the repudiation of fundamental norms. And, and here we are um, pretty much then, you know, already uh, very close to, you know, the work of Oriel and, and others that looked more specifically in, you know, into those issues from a norm contestation perspective. And then we had structural disintegration, and that also relates a bit, you know, to the dimension of what ministries and institutions and how they might, might change um, due to um, the Europeanization um, effects. Um, uh, as a follow-up, uh, I, I teamed up with a, a colleague from Hungary, and we looked at how the foreign ministry in Hungary was changing as a result of um, the Europeanization dynamics. And it was really, really interesting um, because you could see that, you know, that, um, for example, in Hungary, it goes really, really deep. Um, you even have, you know, a new um, diplomatic academy where they train diplomats in very different ways and very different norms um, with a great emphasis also on relations with, with, with Russia. So you can really see that um, it's not only about um, new priority or contesting uh, existing norms, but it's almost like, you know, um, training a new generation of diplomats with a very different um, mindset. Um, you also see how, you know, politics takes over certain parts of foreign policy. And then you see things that I think would be also interesting to study, but very hard to research. And that's almost a little bit more sinister than what we look at in de-Europeanization. And that is that there's quite, you know, a lot of corruption in, in those circles doing foreign policy and that foreign policy is even used for yeah, um, for, for for quite you know interesting uh, purposes. Um, good, and and we looked at also at um, um, you know um, more than the relationship of populism as a driver of the Europeanization, and and I think that's also an important topic because often implicitly it's assumed because populists they have different norms and values or, or certain norms and values that um, clash um, with uh, those norms and values that we traditionally um, associate with Europeanization, you know, that therefore there are a problem. Um, but, but we wanted to see, you know, to what extent these ideological um, differences also have a real um, implications for policy and also for norm contestation, um, because it's not, you know, um, naturally um, to be taken as a pre-given now that, that um, different ideologies also are exercised and practiced Maybe governments also take a more pragmatic stance. Um, there are also important arguments in the literature you know, that you motiv um, moderate when, once you take uh, on governmental duties. So we formulated different hypotheses when we um, expect that populism has a bearing on foreign policy and it relates on the one hand to action capacities. So are you basically in, 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 you know, do you have the power to translate your preferences into foreign policy? Arguably, you know, you are stronger in cases like Hungary when you enjoy comfortable majorities and have time to turn around the foreign policy system rather than, you know, in situations like we had it in Austria where you have a populist party as a um, minor uh, or, or um, coalition party in the government um, or the smaller coalition party in the government. Um, but, but also it you know, depends on things like, can you translate your ideological agenda into foreign policy? For example, there's interesting literature on the case of the United States under Trump that basically argues, well, he was very good in disrupting foreign policy, but not really in infusing new ideas and ideological change that really penetrated um, deeply into the foreign policy um, establishment. So you can formulate, I think, interesting um, um, hypothesis uh, on what drives the Europeanization when you look at um, at um, developments like um, like populism, and and maybe when we um, very briefly wrap up from our special issues, uh, what what did we find? Well, of course, um, you know Brexit is the starkest case of the Europeanization, and it's probably not very surprising. But in several other countries. Um, Central um, European countries, but also countries that initially we don't, um, we didn't have so much on the radar, radar like Estonia. You could really see that um, with those more, let's say, um, 
um, parties outside the mainstream um, assuming government um, responsibility, um, we really see also shifts in foreign policy. And I think that really challenges a bit this argument that foreign policy is a bit removed from party politics, um, that foreign policy you know, is based quite on a broad mainstream consensus. Once mainstream parties um, lose, once um, other parties become more influential, that are outside the mainstream, I think, uh, taking party politics serious in EU foreign policy um, becomes increasingly um, interesting. Um, one thing maybe that would be also very interesting to reflect is that you know, we, we very much focused in our working group on these you know, um, external factors um, that um, challenge cohesion within EU foreign policy. But of course, now uh, also with what happens um, in Ukraine and, and especially with Russia. Um, uh, one can also, of course, uh, um, argue um, to what extent do these um, uh, very, very significant um, external event um, provide clue um, and, and bring uh, Europeans that ha had been quite divided, at least on some issues, closer together. And I guess, I guess that's a question also to be uh, answered only in the months to come. Uh, Europe will um, suffer through a hard winter, and I hope that um, solidarity will hold. Um, um, it has also a lot to do with what happens uh, in Ukraine, and um, I think the recent advances in Ukraine, of course, um, they give a lot of hope to other Europeans. Um, um, so that's also um, something, and I think it's, uh, since we talk a lot about norms and internal EU politics, we shouldn't uh, quite forget um, about, you know, that all this happens in a very serious and and evolving um, context. But that would be already um, for it. Um, uh, again, thanks to everybody who, who contributed, um, not only in our working group. And I would hand over to, to Oriol, who reports on the special issue, but also on some more forward-looking ideas that we have and, and that we are working on at the moment. Okay, so let me move down here. So that was our our uh, starting point, right? Uh, when we started the project, we we were in a way in a in a in a context in which uh, quite a lot of of work was being done on contestation and politicization um, of other stuff, not of EU foreign policy, right? Uh, there were um, people looking at at uh, the uh, contestation of international norms the politicization of of uh, international uh, institutions or the politicization of uh, european integration itself so that it was um, quite a lively uh, landscape already right and these were quite different literatures i i take this from uh, antia Biner's, uh book on on norm contestation and of course uh, the way she looks at these processes uh, she organizes this around this idea of type one two and three uh, norms fundamental norms organizing principles and standardized procedures so you know, all of that looks very different from the sort of approach that the most uh, uh, quantity guys on the politicization side of things uh, um, uh, use, right? In which they they basically they basically uh, divide politicization in a number of different indicators and then add them together or not, right. and then look at how they have changed um, over time. So the, they they are different uh, literatures, quite different literatures from from an ontological and methodological point of view. But nevertheless, there were there were a few a few common arguments, I would say, or a few common, sometimes implicit arguments uh, in 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 those in those uh, different branches of the literature. Uh, the first one is that uh, political conflict was changing, right? That, that, that there were that, you know, there was reason to look again at, at political conflict as something that uh, we should not um, see as constant over time, but but changing as regards a number of different levels and a number of different of different um, uh, object uh, reference objects, right? Uh, both within and outside of the of the EU, and that this was happening after. The high watermark of of the international liberal order, right? The liberal international order had reached the high watermark in in its high watermark at, at the beginning of of the two thousands, and and we were moving from a body of literature that, as uh, Patrick said at the beginning, looked at you know the norm diffusion and norm cascades, and we to 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 phrases such as normal regress, normal erosion, um, you know, 
um, questions around norm robustness, uh, norm contestation, all of that was very much uh, for a number of different norms, international norms. I, I quote a few here in this slide, or a number of different uh, political levels. Uh, that was all uh, very much the, the, the talk, right? Uh, in, in this, um, in this, in this, this um, approach, this landscape of of you know, sprawling uh, um, research did not really fit very well with uh, what had become um, the default option in in EU foreign policy studies. Right? We we tended to look at EU foreign policy more in terms of policies than in terms of politics, or right? more in terms of analyzing and describing what the EU was doing in trying to understand the political debate that was behind those those policies right and when we did focus on 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 politics then then we normally look at it in terms of uh, uh, rather more classical uh, uh, approaches not 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 in terms of a changing political the, the changing contours of political conflict but in in in, in rather classical ways right um uh, States versus EU institutions, um, you know, um, national level versus uh, supranational, intergovernmental versus uh, uh, supranational, uh, competing national foreign policy traditions that stem from being a big state or a, or a middle state or, or or whatnot, right? But there was very little in terms of, for instance, whether there was any transnational school of thought uh, that we could identify, Knutetic. Uh, Jorgensen had had pointed in that direction, you know, wondering whether that could be the case, um, and 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 in many occasions we also had this sort of you know inside out externalization of internal governance um, uh, structures, externalization of internal consensuses, externalization of internal fu um, 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 functionalist uh, uh, processes that made seem EU foreign policy rather unpolitical, right? That made seem uh, EU foreign policy basically like the external the image of internal um, agreements in, 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 in a way. This of course went well beyond uh, normative power Europe, which would be the quintessential expression of that if, if you wish, right? So the, our question was whether these guys here um, were you know, raising issues that we had to take into account even if we came from this sort of trend in the later years of, of, of literature on new foreign policy. Um, of course, you know, we were not the only ones posing these uh, questions. There's a number of different uh, groups and people who had already, who were already in the process of publishing their own um, uh, work and stuff and, and you know sometimes really or not, not sometimes on many occasions really really good stuff that we have used at large uh, in in our in our uh, working group number number three um so it's not it's not that the landscape was only populated by by us of course there were many many other groups doing doing basically the same but we had two 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 concerns um, the first one is we detected sort of um, reaction against uh, uh, this literature, right? There was this, uh, I think, well-justified reaction with the idea of, yeah, perhaps there's this myth of a golden age of consensus now being broken by contesters, uh, but is this really the case? Hasn't always CFSP been against politics? Have, hasn't always been CFSP and EU foreign policy more, more, more uh, broadly uh, about states not being able to you know agree with one another you know how how all this political conflict in in this in this framework and then of course we had the fact that uh, eu foreign policy is a complicated case right when you look at how uh, people working on on the politicization of of in european integration itself um, uh, work they 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 basically um use broad concern in the public or even mass mobilization as you know high salience as um, even a sine qua non condition for politicization to exist and of course that's most of the time not the case in in eu foreign in eu foreign policy right uh, on many occasions that's that's a condition we don't we don't meet in our in our field so that we 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 found that also a bit a bit complicated I think that in, in working group three, we address this by way of, of um, 
two different uh, two different uh, special issues. One at global affairs, and, and we have uh, a few of the contributors to that special issue here around us, including uh, Francisca Petri, who has been um, nice enough to to uh, volunteer for discussing this little presentation we are doing now uh and and she was also a co-editor of that special issue and another one that i co-edited with uh, katia biedenkov and, and magdalena gora um on on european uh, security right we had a key a few key hypotheses the first one is that disagreements on eu foreign policy were not new for sure but what was new was that now some of these some of these agreements had a greater potential for, for you know, uh, being able to spill beyond the circles of EU foreign policy to be in sync with broader ways to structure political conflict. Um, and that this was particularly so in, in the areas of EU uh, external relations that were more tightly integrated, think, think uh, trade, for instance, right? So we developed a, a sort of a scale of different ways in which uh, contestation or politicization could exist in EU foreign policy, depending on whether actor range, uh, polarization and salience were involved in that, in that change. So we had this, uh, five step scale from no change to mass politicization, which we only expected to exist uh, uh, and only, you know, uh, sporadically when it came to uh, highly integrated uh, issue areas. Um, and this, this is uh, something that we applied in, 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 in one of the of these two uh, special issues. And then we also divided the, uh, the whole work in 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 you know intergovernmental negotiations and including at the EU level and and, and more community method uh, aspects of it. I'm, I'm not going to uh, go too much into it because otherwise it, uh, we will run out of time. So the core finding of of of, of these uh, working group three, I think, would be that for sure part of the political conflict does link up to broader themes uh, and hence are more likely to be politicized to, to, to spill over beyond or to, to involve people beyond the, the usual circles of, of EU foreign um, uh, policy. This is particularly the case uh, in issues that are strongly value laden. Um, uh, Diego Badel, who is around, uh, uh, I think uh, I, I've seen him in, in the list of participants here, um, has looked at, at sexual and reproductive health and rights, for instance, which has been very much the, the, the case. Um, sometimes on the perceived authority of international or European institutions, particularly international institutions, that has been the case of, of the Global Migration Compact. Um, trade, as I mentioned before, is also an issue in which, precisely because uh, uh, there's such much, uh, uh, such a lot of uh, um, uh, authority, um, authority transfer to uh, uh, European and, and international uh, institutions, that is particularly the, the case, and also the ally um, alignment with other great powers, right? And 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 we have uh, a piece by by Chepo and and Karlovich on sanctions on Russia, for instance, right? Um, um, another key funding is that uh, um, uh, such such process of politicization or contestation uh, frequently affects both uh, substantive and procedural issues, both both substantive norms and procedural norms within within the council um, uh, structure, and that this actually contributes to the perception that this is that this contestation is is just different from 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 the usual political conflict in in the council there are procedural rules that are in a way uh, not honored in, in in this process by 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 challengers right on, on not um, uh, not uh, reopening a greed language for instance or 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 having to justify your own positions and 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 so on and of course this is all double and triple edged from 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 the point of from a normative uh, from a normative point of view right um a good deal of 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 this contestation um and how the eu responds or other states respond to this uh, contestation is a bit more complicated than just this uh, illiberal versus liberal 
uh, values uh, story that that you might that you might think of when 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 addressing these, right? Um, whether the EU has um, also a procedural norm to follow in trying to engage these countries and take their positions into account, that's also normatively charged, right? Uh, whether contestation is just um, a condition for for legitimacy. Whether well, contestability is part of legitimacy, um, a, condi a condition for legitimacy, that's also a long-lasting uh, argument in, in the literature on on democratic uh, theory, right? So there are many ways in which you could you could you could address this. Okay, and finally, here um, I think that uh, we 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 stumbled into a, a rather puzzling finding, and this is common to both uh, working group three and four, right? Um, we expected EU foreign policy to really be under threat, right? both in terms of substantive and procedural norms. Um, if the EU foreign policy making does depend on, on you know, Europeanization, on socialization, on informal procedures within the council structure, on fragile consensuses, on um, if, if all that is the case, then we expected contestation to be um, you know, wrecking ball into the edifice of, of the EU foreign policy making um, uh, system. Right? But actually what we find is quite a lot of quite a lot of resilience. And this is what we are trying to do in, in, our, in our next step. We are, we are trying to address this puzzle of, of the coexistence of contestation and resilience um, in a way and try to uh, account for the terms of EU foreign policy. We, we put together a symposium or we are trying to put together a symposium section um, for a journal, the agreement is mostly done. We still need the final confirmation, but it seems that the journal is interested and we are interested as well, of course, uh, which will be co-edited by uh, Anna Juncos, Patrick Muller, uh, Helen Schurschen, and, and myself, right? And we look at both at the structural and agentic factors that might be contributing uh, to, to, this, to this resilience of, of EU foreign policy uh, making in the face of uh, contestation, right? Um, when we look at structure-centered uh, approaches, of course, the point here is that norms, we expect norms to be rather stable. That's, that's what norms are about, right? They, they, they are uh, assumed by definition to be rather, you know, relatively stable uh, um, uh, behavioral prescriptions, right? Um, so some of them at least should be able to sustain some kind of uh, uh, contestation. And there's here the idea that you know, there's applicatory contestation that is, uh, it can even be uh, uh, useful for, you know, can even reinforce norms as opposed to justificatory contestation, right? The idea that contestation uh, allows norms to be localized and hence to be seen as more legitimate and more, more effective, right? Um, another argument here would be that it is uh, norm clusters, not individual norms that matter, right? And that norm clusters, these collections of aligned but distinctive norms, in a way, uh, stabilize each other, right? Or, or have internal stabilizing uh, mechanisms. And you can unpick uh, uh, perhaps a, a piece of those norm clusters, but the norm cluster remains stable and tends to regenerate itself, uh, uh, as it, you know, as, as so, 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 to, so to speak. Right? And there are other issues here that have to do with the nature of, of the norm and how much they have been codified that might also explain why they are resilient. And then we try to, and of course, the, all this comes from the literature, right? The literature has um, uh, talked about this at length. And we try to make another contribution here, which is uh, more of an agentic explanation of, of this resilience. Um, our idea here is that, and this is harder to come by in the literature, our, our idea here is that there are um, processes that are taking place within the, for, the EU foreign policy making system that also account for this for this resilience right and and in a way we we come up with um, we, we use this with this term that is used in many other literatures on sociology of knowledge or sociology of professions or you know um, uh, ethnic relationships of boundary work right and we we, we try to look at the creation of um, in-group and out-group divi uh, divisions within within the EU and, and, and the way in which this division is, is kept alive by, by both sides of, of that divide, right? And, and how contestation uh, has different effects, uh, is not, not blind to this division and has different effects depending on whether the challengers come from the out group or the challengers come from the in group, right? Um, 
if they if contestation if challenges come from the in group then these challenges are normalized right um the domain reserve we use that that phrase a lot in in eu foreign policy talk um uh, there are legitimate national interests that are respected right these are just naturalized uh, challenges um of course you know fund, founding eu member states are more all the more likely to to be awarded this this uh, this privilege right while um if they come from the out group some of these uh, challenges are ostracized right? um and 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 you know keeping keeping the in group safe from outgroup pollution, so to speak, justifies even mending formal and informal rules that regulate decision making within the EU foreign policy making system, right? We have a few pieces that look at how, uh, and Diego Badet again has raised that on for a couple of, of case studies along, along the process, how, how they mend these rules and, and yeah, just to, you know, encapsulate uh, criticism or, or contestation and, and, and move ahead. Um, of course, normatively, again, this is super complicated, right? There's, um, uh, on the one hand, you have the protection of established norms, which might be seen as good in itself, on the other hand, and the cooperation system, of course. On the other hand, um, uh, some, of these, some of these challenges might be seen perhaps as, you know, um, signals that, that some response needs to be uh, come up with or, or, or that established norms uh, um, might not be adequate in, in, in light of new realities, perhaps. Right. So um, uh, those are different, uh, of course, normatively uh, uh, um, options, right? Uh, we have a few contributions. I'm, I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm just uh, two minutes away or one minute away from finishing this part of the presentation. So I, I, we've got a, a few, a few contributions for that uh, symposium uh, section. Um, uh, Federica Vicky and, and Hennis Kursen are looking at, at the normative uh, pool for integration. Uh, so there's a, a, a pool that is normative in itself and that uh, makes states want to keep the system uh, together, so to speak. Then we have uh, uh, Badel, who looks particularly at, at boundary work on uh, sexual health and reproductive, uh, sexual and reproductive health and rights. Um, we have uh, Patrick Muller and, and Carla Monteleone. I think that uh, she is around as, as, as well, and, and they look at the puzzling level of, of adaptation by Hungary to the positions taken by the EU at the UNGA. Right? Um, uh, Bergman and Furness, and I think that uh, one of them is around as well, uh, look at, at the clash and the resilience of the two different norm clusters on, on EU foreign and development policies towards fragile and conflict affected states and how, how in a way the fact that they are clusters make them uh, resilient vis-a-vis uh, -vis that, that clash. Uh, it's, it's really difficult to, to to you know to um, sweep away one one of one of them, and finally uh, Natalia Chavan and Ole Ekstrom uh, look at uh, the resilience of of the normative development of the external image of the EU. So they they uh, look at at the outside in view of of these things. Right? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Oriol. And now we have uh, time for for our discussion. And again. Thank you so much, Francisca, for doing this on, on short notice and from very far away and with a very different time now on watch. Um, so, so that's really that's really excellent. And and hopefully we can also direct then our discussions a bit, you know, into those aspects that uh, Oriel um, presented when we open up, at least now uh, presented on, on more forward looking issues, because several of us now who contribute are here. And I think that would be wonderful to deepen these um, discussions, especially. But uh, Thanks a lot, and, and uh, the floor is yours, Francisca. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so hello, everyone. Um, it's a bit darker here, so I'm speaking from Canberra, so sorry if I'm uh, speaking with a bit of a long day uh, already. Um, but thanks for inviting me to give some comments. Um, I think it's been really interesting also to hear a bit more about the Europeanization working group, because I've been more involved in the contestation ones. So it's always interesting to see also some maybe um, issues that we could address together. Um, and before I start on the content, I, since this is the final conference um, of this network, I also want to take a very short moment to just thank the organizers um, of this cost action and also the working group, because it's been a very, um, very interesting and nice network to work in, and especially for young uh, career researchers. I think it's been a great opportunity to engage on these concepts in, in such a 
uh, intense framework, at least I was able to participate in a lot of things, and I think it really helped uh, me work on these concepts. Um, so what can I say about these very comprehensive findings? And of course, we've also published those on the topic. Um, and since I've been working on the concept of contestation specifically in my PhD, but then moved away from it, um, I kind of took a moment to think about how has sort of my position towards the concept maybe changed. And I remember in the beginning being very enthusiastic about reading Vina and getting into all these conceptual propositions, starting to use them. And then I also saw in the literature the concept coming up more and more. And I checked early on Web of Science um, and contestation has really gone up so much uh, since 2014, also with our publications, also with the special issues. But at the same time, I've become more critical with the use of the concept because a lot of people use it. And I'm not sure whether everyone applies the same conceptual position in using it. Um, so I think this has also been a bit of a struggle within our working group at times. I remember Oriol and Porto saying, so what would Wiener know say now? Would she actually agree with us and how we have started to use contestation as a concept? Um, and I think one aspect on that, which, which I find very difficult is, is in a way also what she says herself, contestation doesn't have to be a bad thing because very often we look at contestation as a conflict, as something that's negative, as something that's gonna um, drive member states apart. But in the end, I think the way she, she understands it, and I think in a way it's a bit of a constructive way of looking at it, it's critical engagement, which can also lead to norm change, which can be positive. And I think also when I use contestation in daily life, and I think in a lot of publications, it's really seen as something negative. And I think keeping this conceptual precision in mind, thinking about how we use the concept um, is quite important. And also in the process of writing a special issue, we've always been looking back at, wait, what is actually being contested? Who is actually the one contesting? Because talking about conception, uh, about contestation, I think is quite easy, but then finding the right levels of analysis, the right tools and methods to really be precise. And this is what we mean by contestation. And this is how we can be sure that this is actually an effective contestation. I think this has been quite an interesting experience and quite a learning curve, at least um, for me. And I think that within this working group, we also really made some interesting conceptual advancement. I think this nice metrics that you had in the slides, which I don't think you showed, um, but voila, with where you show the also politicization stages, et cetera. And that might be something I wanted to comment on because I was actually wondering to what extent has this reached outside the EU foreign policy people? Um, so I think that the special issues have maybe been received quite nicely within our EU foreign policy crowd, but I was wondering to what extent has maybe Wiener seen this or Dietrich and Zimmermann? So have we stayed with our debates on contestation, politicization, your foreign policy state within our crowd? Or should we maybe move outside and try to also engage with the IR people that have been working on these concepts for a bit longer? Might be a bit of a normative question. I think it's always a bit of a problem when you publish on EU foreign policy, you don't always reach the IR people, but I think these are conceptual reflections that, are, that could be really interesting uh, also to take outside of what we've been doing. Um, then maybe as a second point, and I think um, this also came up in the slides, but you also said it, I think we had quite a variety of findings on causes, modes, and effects of contestation. So we had one special issue on European security. We also had the one special issue um, by Bergman and others on the politicization in development policy. And also in the special issue where I was um, happy to be the co-editor, we tried to look at sort of arena specific modes of contestation. I think there is a lot more in that. We can see that trade works differently than defense policies. We can see that in climate, there's different dynamics. So what I'm wondering is, should we sort of take this to the next level and really try to look at contestation in separate uh, channels or silos? Or would that take away the fun of seeing sort of cross silo insights on contestation? Because on the one hand, there is something to these, let's say, competency-specific or Commission DG-specific even um, aspects. The Arctic might just work very differently than the MENA region. Um, so policy area-specific, but also actor-specific um, reflections have started to sort of come up in, in our special issue, and I think also in the others. So is contestation by some member states, and I think this also speaks to what Oriol just said, just different from contestation uh, done by member states like Lithuania. Uh, does contestation within the parliament work differently than in the commission? I think that's also something that in the IR reflection on non contestation has come up more specifically, who actually has the agency to contest and where does contestation take place in different fora 
and non-state actors like NGOs have different access to, for example, the UNFCCC than the US. Um, so we have a lot of interesting findings and I think, and the question is, and we tried this also at the ECPR general section, should we stay in these areas of the multifaceted uh, foreign policy that we have? Or should we continue trying to sort of cross-fertilize um, in our study of contestation? Um, and maybe one reflection on that, um, which I have now in particular doing field work, um, because one of the aspects I'm trying to understand is how is the EU contested abroad? Um, and then again, it brought me back to what is contestation actually, because sometimes I have the impression that people don't even really care or they don't even know about what's going on at the EU. So while we study all the things about EU contestation, the internal level and uh, specific discussions within the parliament, you go to countries um, like Nigeria or Australia, people will say, yes, yes, the EU has a green deal, but they won't actually know that maybe at the moment there's a bit of a conflict on the green deal. So, or they might, and they will tell you, well, but Germany is actually deviating from the green deal at the moment, going back to the coal. So, how do external perceptions of contestation also feed into what's happening within the EU on contestation? So this external influence, which I think Patrick also brought up in Europeanization um, discussions, I think is something we could also have brought in a bit more because I think there was also one working group working on those aspects. So maybe that's another thing. How can external perceptions affect within EU contestation uh, and the other way around. Um, and we also had one contribution our special issue where we actually looked at these external perceptions and agency a bit more closely by Nejma Jelanovic, who's also here. Um, and then a third last comment maybe, um, because I thought a bit about this, this new concept and the new approach, which I think is, is really interesting. So contested but resilient, accounting for the endurance of EU foreign policy. Um, and I'm wondering whether endurance will be more of a metaphor or whether you will use it as a real concept with, let's say, in-depth reflection on what does endurance mean? Um, is it resilience, but with added capabilities? Um, is it a way for us to kind of take time into account? Um, because in the end, it made me think about the fact that when we started this cost action, uh, the first training school in Darmstadt, uh, where I met most of the people, here, we talked about the new realities, which are entirely different from what we're doing at the moment. There are some that have kind of continued, so the EU had to be endurant uh, in dealing with those aspects. Um, some may have reached a tipping point in the end, and then that's something where we could use maybe IR, non-contestation theory again. So when can crises, can points of conflict reach a tipping point, and then endurance doesn't suffice anymore? Or on which policy areas is the EU maybe endurant? Um, so yeah, that, that concept made me think a bit about the, the perceptions of crisis or of contestation and how that changes over time. Uh, at the time we thought Trump was the worst thing that could happen <laughs> to the international arena. Now uh, things have changed slightly, but now we have war uh, in Europe. So how do we deal with new realities that keep changing and how can then endurance sort of uh, work as a concept? I think that could be an interesting reflection. And that will be it from my side. Again, thank you for inviting me to speak on this. Um, I hope what I said made sense. Sorry, it's a bit late. <laughs> but yeah, thanks again for inviting us all to join today and the action. Yeah, thank you so much, Francisca, for, for all these um, you know, very interesting um, observations and also for reminding us now that we have to be very careful to frame uh, anything nowadays as the worst thing that could happen. Uh, we, we always get a bit uh, surprised then, no? But but uh, yeah, excellent uh, excellent comments. I liked a lot. Um, you know, also you know, um, encouraging you know to to think about um, you know things that matter to EU foreign policy more broadly. You know, like settings, like type of actors, also in relation you know with debates that evolve in international relations. And we still have a, a workshop on the symposium mentioned by Oriel, and it would be maybe a, a very nice idea to, you know, invite um, colleagues from other research communities to the workshop, especially when you touch on, you know, on issues that are of broader, of broader relevance. Um, but uh, I think we have about uh, a half an hour, a bit more for, for discussions, and I, I wouldn't want to structure it too much. So um, if anybody would like to um, kick it off with, with a question, following up on the on the comments, but also on the presentation, um, that would be um, that would be wonderful. Mm -hmm. 
think uh, everybody has to uh, to digest still a bit. Um, Ariel. Patrick, yeah. if nobody wants to wait in, I can uh, break the eyes. And, and I think that the um, the way I'm now seeing this, perhaps it's because I cut my my head, uh, you know, in the whole of this uh, 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 symposium section that we are trying to to put together. The way I and, and this might have blindsided me, uh, but the way I'm looking at this now is that. To a large extent, the, the reason why we, why normally contestation is seen as negative, the why there is this normative bias is precisely because we, because the use of, of contestation is not blind to this uh, uh, internal, uh, you know, in-group, out-group division within the EU, right? But we normally use contestation to, to describe what uh, uh, members of the out-group do. Which we find, you know, and these typically would be, you know, populist governments that defend illiberal values, right? And 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 this is problematized uh, as an intrusion into the system, um, while uh, challenges coming from the in group, these are not seen as intrusions into the system. These are seen as legitimate national positions, right? And this goes from I don't know the uh, the uh, uh, um, um, I would say the uh, growth, st stability and growth pact, right? To uh, which has nothing to do with you for a policy, of course. To uh, to what not, right? To to whatever other issue might be might be the case, right? Um, uh, defense spending, right? common defense spending, for instance. Uh, so you 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 would you would you would find here um, in, precisely in that division in the fact that. Um, it, it is not, you know, contestation is a different phenomenon uh, for the actors that take part in the system, depending on whether it comes from an outsider or an, or, or an insider. That there's quite a lot of boundary work. That when it comes from an outsider, the question is not only how you defend the, um, you know, uh, norms that undergrid EU foreign policy. But that maintaining the distinction between outsiders and insiders becomes a niche in itself, right? Uh, that this is what that that keeping the foreign policy making system safe from intrusions is seen as an aim in itself. It's, it is precisely that that makes uh, our our view of contestation um, uh, negative, right? That 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 it, it comes from from such a group of, of states. It's, it's uh, perhaps it's it's a bit more of a constructivist approach to 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 this, right? In which contestation is basically seen as as a social uh, interaction that, of course, takes boundaries uh, into into account, right? Uh, that's my position. Perhaps it's a bit hermetic, or the way I frame it is 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 a bit hermetic yet. Um, but that's that's how uh, uh, I would see it. I and mean, of course, it also has to do with the issue of agency. Who is allowed to be? Uh, an effective contester and who is not allowed to be a, a, an effective con contester. And of course, if we look at it from this point of view, then why contestation fails to destabilize the whole system is not a big puzzle. Uh, it fails to destabilize because that's what, uh, because contestation is what losers do, what people on the losing side of the debate will do. That's what uh, outsiders will do. And hence, there are many ways in which you can keep the system together. Right? Or at least a few ways in which you can keep the system together from such from such uh, intrusions. That's that's the way I'm I'm trying to look at, at this uh, uh, now. I might be wrong. Yeah. Aslam, you had a question. Uh, yes, thank you. I actually um, would like to continue exactly at the point that Oriol lifted in this sense uh, that, you know, when contestation is defined as what the, um, the losers or the outsiders do to contest the mainstream EU, then we are actually adopting a very EU-centered approach. And in the special issue that Francisca and her colleagues edited, what I was looking at is, was the case of the Arctic region where EU is not the dominant actor. And I had looked at the case where what happens to contesting EU norms in a region where EU itself is not the dominant actor was quite interesting to see, because actually, there were many cases where the EU itself sometimes found it, uh, itself to be irrelevant 
or actually itself as the contester because there were other norms at play, those of Russia or United States or Canada and such. And therefore it was very interesting to see the EU case uh, in this region of its non-dominance. So um, I would say it's, when we are looking into the uh, resilience of EU's uh, foreign policy with respect to different policy areas or regions uh, or on the whole, I think it might be a good starting point to define where EU stands with respect to the others at first, and then therefore generalize the results from this, where is the center question, and then uh, discuss the resilience and contestation from there. So that would be my contribution <laughs> to, as, as a perspective. Thank you. Thanks, and I think that's a very important comment and also relates a bit what Francisca now was 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 uh, alluding to now that, that uh, when you look from the outside, it can look uh, very different. I think what, uh, kind of to add to to Oriol's um, uh, comments. Now, what, what we want to do in the symposium is to to have a kind of a you know the, the subjectiveness of of contestation um, um, bring it more to the to the forefront. Now, um, and and I think from from interviews that you can already you know read um, a little bit between the lines for from some of the special issues, it's really that actors um, distinguish um, who contests and what is kind of the reputation and the standing and very similar kind of behaviors will be regarded um, very differently depending on yeah, in groups and out group dynamics and and things like this you now and in groups and out groups, of course, are very setting uh, specific you now, um, uh, you know, some actor might be an uh, belonging to an out group in, in, you know, the context of a very liberal um, EU um, value community. But then when you go to a different setting, as you mentioned in the Arctic, you know, the EU mainstream can be an outsider. You know? um, and the same thing, like the EU looks at contestation you know, within of its own norms, it might think, you know, this is something not very appropriate to do. But then, you know, it, it might find norms that it finds quite worthwhile contesting itself uh, when it enters different settings. Um, so, so I think um, uh, maybe this also, you know, looking at more like intersubjective norm dynamics could be of help um, to, to address, you know, some of these um, observations. Excellent. It may be also, you know, an opportunity for those uh, contributing uh, chapters now to the symposium to to relate to these uh, arguments or, or any other question really is um, is appreciated. Otherwise, Oriol has to stop in again. <laughs> Okay, just for the sake of making Patrick's threat credible. Um, um, Francisco raised the issue of silos as well, right? On, on, on whether, you know, there's these setting specific processes that take place. And of course, this has to do with the fact that of, of many issues, right? Uh, there is one issue that has to do with, with saliency, right? Relative saliency of different issues. It's climate is not the same as, uh, you know, I don't know. Um, other 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 topics and and, and um, there is another issue here that has to do with the fact that in e different settings manage perhaps this uh, outsider insider uh, divide differently right so perhaps uh, the UNGA being an outsider has uh, very little sense it makes makes very little sense and has lots of costs perhaps and being an insider. Uh, opens up a few, a few, a few avenues that that might that might be cl uh, closed uh, otherwise, right? Um, but there is a, a deeper problem in in this side of thing, I I I I I think, which is not only related to the fact that 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 we look at specific issues, but that specific issues have researchers that are specialized in looking at specific arenas, right? If if part of prioritization has to do with debates spilling over from one arena to the next not you know remaining within the council but which perhaps the part the european parliament and which had never reached right or or not so frequently before or reaching national parliaments or you know uh, leaking into the uh, leaking into the press into the media or being taken up by ngos right if, if it has to do with 
expanding the the uh, uh, range of actors that take part in these in these debates. Of course, uh, most of, of of our of the people in our in our community, your broader community, not only this project, this action, but much more broadly, are really specific researchers, and they they know how to look at the parliament itself, or they know how to look at at uh, you know public opinion, or they know how to look at surveys, uh, or they know how to look at at uh, the council, right? Um, but it's it's hard to come to to to, to put together pieces that are, you know specific researches that that look at these um, spillover effects or as, as you know as, as these as these effects by which uh, um, uh, politicization or contestation. Uh, leaks from one arena to the next and becomes much much broader. So I, I think it it's it's both a, in a way horizontal uh, uh, silos in different in different uh, domains, but also perhaps vertical silos in in different um, you know in different arenas within the same issue area. Yeah, I think that's that's a very good observation. I think another um, another um, you know observation maybe that's that worth sharing is that you know when one critically looks at you know at our special issues on um, you know it also applies to of course the one that, that we co-edited. You know, um, by by specifying a certain framework, of course we we shift all the attention you now on on those issues and then uh, often we work with you know individual case studies of, of contestation or de-europeanization and you know that's really what um what the authors look at what i feel is still kind of of missing is a, a broader perspective you know of um how how prevalent um this is i think that's also something that you know that um, we try to do at by looking you know with, with carla now by looking at the un setting and study you know very many issue areas and you know um very broadly and then see um how how contestation matters also by by populist uh, governments now we know already from individual case studies it happens in some cases but are those very isolated examples that on the whole you know are not very representative or are those broader dynamics and and this is something that i also find still um, difficult to to really have you know the picture yes we know you know that there are from from an eu perspective there are prominent cases um, also in some issue areas but we don't really know how how representative this is um for the overall um you know um policy making um etc but we have now uh, two um two questions i think um yeah please please just uh, go ahead i don't i don't let me see here. Uh, it says two people raised their hands, but I cannot see the names. So whoever yeah, would like. Carla, Carla is the first one. Okay, Carla, yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, Oriol, I was thinking about this in-group, out-group dynamics, and I was thinking about the many cases uh, uh, in which uh, uh, governments uh, are part of the in-group, uh, but would like to present themselves uh, as if they were part of the outgroup. And I'm really thinking about the case of Italy and uh, uh, positions uh, adopted uh, uh, rhetorically uh, by governments uh, uh, over time uh, as if uh, uh, the country was uh, uh, really contesting, uh, uh, but at the same time uh, voting exactly as the in-group, so in continuity. So I think this is also something else uh, uh, that uh, is uh, worth exploring, uh, these uh, uh, rhetorical shifts uh, that take place uh, without uh, an actual uh, uh, change uh, uh, in uh, foreign policy behavior taking change. Julian. Uh, thank you very much for, for the uh, very insightful uh, inputs on the presentations. I, I don't have like a structured reflection on the on the questions that were uh, brought up, but maybe two or three spontaneous reactions on, especially on the question um, how to move forward or where, where there are still blind spots. And in the symposium that you also presented, we, we, we address one important 
which is this linkage between uh, contestation and resilience. What I also echoing a little bit Franziska's comment, what I think where still is potential is this combining the, the contestation and politicization literature with a decentering agenda in EU foreign policy. So how do like uh, external perceptions affect within EU politicization? And in the, in the special issue we had in JCMS on EU development policy, we actually saw that politicization in third countries of EU action is um, is taken into account in EU decision making uh, at home and decision making within EU member states, and uh, and there the question is also um, if if the EU is not if EU action is not politicized or the EU is actually not actually perceived as an actor at all, what does it tell us about EU external? Uh, action. So um, it could still tell us something about contestation or, or politicization. And then the second issue or second question I have, I had to myself is, is there actually a link between uh, politicization, contestation and the whole debate about EU actorness and foreign policy that we have? I mean, we have moved away from the concept of actorness for a long time, but I was wondering, whether, um, I mean, it's still relevant and activeness is usually defined as like being based on internal characteristics uh, of the EU. Um, but I was wondering whether if there is contestation and politicization, does it tell us about, does it tell us anything about the, the EU's um, actor qualities? Uh, for example, what does it tell us about authority of EU? of the EU as a foreign policy actor. So that was a question I had to myself, that I, we can actually also make a link um, from the, this debate on politicization and contestation to other debates uh, that we had in EU foreign policy, like the one on, on activeness. And finally, um, I was wondering whether, I mean, we in this project and this working group, we analyzed politicization, contestation, EU foreign policy. There's, uh, a separate literature on uh, politicization and contestation in trade policy. You also worked a bit on, on development policy. So I was wondering, can we draw any conclusions to on about like to what extent politicization and contestation differ in EU foreign policy related to other external policy fields? Uh, that would be something I think also interesting to explore. Are there any um, yeah, commonalities, but also differences between uh, yeah, politicization phenomena that we observed in trade policy and in EU foreign policy. So taking a little bit the cross policy perspective, I don't know whether such work already exists, but I, I think that would be also something worth to, to look at. That would be for my side, just three spontaneous things, uh, spontaneous on how to move forward. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks a lot. and. and... I think you know um, several very interesting observations and 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 you know some things that really run through our discussions. Um, you know this this link to the you know to to this type of research to the decentering agenda. We had also one one workshop now with Stefan Kortgleiter where he reported and I also thought you know it it speaks very nice and interlinks with with certain aspects. And then Tonra also made a, an interesting comment in in that regard. Ben, would you like to say maybe something about? The work you you mentioned or, or no I, I was just responding to uh, to Iona's question about what what contestation implies in terms of the EU's institutions um, mm. and uh, Nicola Tomic and I uh, through the Globus project had been looking at uh, conflict resolution strategies of the European Union um, and what we'd identified was it was a need in an era of, of greater contestation again with the inside outside dimension you've already mentioned that the EU's diplomatic practice has got to be a little bit more sophisticated, a little bit new, more nuanced, a little bit more tailored and more bottom up. Um, I mean, and, and down to things as practical as, you know, language skills of, of EU diplomats, their engagement with civil society, their engagement with local actors, and less of what I think is what many of us would have seen as a more traditional top down approach in which the EU brings sort of fully fledged packages of policies to its partners and says, you know, sign here on the dotted line. So yeah. that's 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 what what we, what we were certainly arguing in 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 the book we published last year. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Thanks, thanks, Ben. 
I don't see any raised hands at the moment. Oriel, would you like to maybe make a, a final point or, or respond to some of the comments? Uh, Talk too much already, but um, my my I think that my um, from of course we don't have cross case study um, research that that checks whether politicization on trade is different from politicization on other. But if I if if we compare what has been published uh, on you know this silo structured uh, research, my my feeling is that when you touch upon trade, you have uh, instances of um, both much higher politicization. Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, debates percolating into the national and regional uh, regional levels of, of EU politics, in part because that's that's what constitutionally uh, is demanded by some the constitution of some of some member states, right? When you when you start dealing with uh, uh, mixed uh, agreements, uh, uh, then then and, and many of these trade agreements are mixed agreements, and of course you know trade agreements become also part of what can be talked about at national and even sometimes regional levels, um, and it, it it involves a large a much larger um, uh, you know beyond governmental actors, you know, you will have social society organizations and, 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 and whatnot. Of course, TTIP here is the, uh, the best example. Um, my feeling also is that uh, the EU, precisely because that's what happens, the EU is a bit more responsive. Uh, and I have Johan Eli Eliasson here, I think, around, and, and he and, um, and Patricia Garcia Duran, uh, uh, a colleague of mine from, from Barcelona, have been looking at how there was, there is some, some sort of um, default discourse in, in, in the Commission that kicks in uh, every time there is such a spike in contestation, right? And that has to do with, in a way, uh, new, more recent versions of the old discourse about managed globalization, right? The, the, how, how that gets reenacted and rehearsed once and again when, when contestation picks up on, on, on trade policies. And I think that you, you don't really find that in other, in other areas of EU foreign policy. And, and it might have to do with the fact that, of course, this is a much more integrated area in which the EU is more able to uh, find the unit zone discourse without needing a big consensus of all member states to do so. And also because, uh, uh, of course, more integration means that even from a functional point of view, the politics of it all is transferred uh, upwards uh, as well. That would be uh, perhaps my reaction to what uh, Julian said on, on, on that. Yeah. But yeah, I think that well, Johan, Johan has unmuted himself. Yeah, I just wanted to add one one comment on that as what he all brought it up. Um, I think some of the new, and we just were working on a paper for Oriol and, and Patricia, some of the new instruments coming out of trade policy, particularly the Anti-Coercion and the Due Diligence Act, which are not strictly trade policy instruments, but that are presented under the TFEU's articles on, on um, commercial policy, will... Um, merge or bridge the, the traditional foreign policy areas too, particularly on, on anti-coercion where commission is proposing that sanctions can be imposed by the by the commission and then potentially blocked by the council in reversal of, of the current situation on, on sanctions. So um, that would be another avenue of, of looking at contestation um, along with saying things like human you know, human rights, labor, and, and environment, which are also part of the new massive packages of, of different um, trade instruments, generally speaking, that the Commission has and are proposing. Sort of the straddle foreign policy and, and, and commercial policy. Great. Yeah, thank you so much. And, and I always feel when one does these workshops and, and listens to the ideas, it would be possible to continue this um, network for another 10 years, uh, probably. Um, but of course, you know, we, we are entering the, the final months and it would be great, of course, to see all of you um, at the MC meeting. This is important because we still uh, need to uh, take also relevant uh, decisions. Um, 
And then, of course, um, you know, there's a budget left, so we can have a, a final round of, of workshops. Um, the, the theme that Aurel and I proposed, uh, the symposium, we will have an, another workshop aiming for um, February. So, so it will be great to, of course, you know, have you engaged until, you know, the final moment uh, in the uh, in the meeting, and uh, I see um, Michelle. I don't know. Would you like to say maybe one or two words? I just wanted to say the final moment is fourth of April. Yeah. <laughs> this yeah. is our new deadline. We got extended yeah. half a year with yeah. new budget also. Uh, so we still have a little bit to go, but not not too much. Yeah, and we have to be in mind now that we need to do all the the bookkeeping, uh, so to speak. So I think like February will be really the the last months where we can have activities and then we have to kind of wrap it up but uh, as you will hear now it was very uh, I think very successful from the output and it was amazing you know especially the input from everybody even during you know corona and and all the the other challenges um, faced over the past years so I think that's uh, yeah also a nice moment to, to thank everybody and uh, we hope to see you again uh, in the evening um, and of course then in the final rounds of, of workshops and uh, also of course there are still missions that uh, people can do in other institutions um, but but again always with a planning that you know in in April it's it's uh, yeah it's the final uh, day of the um, of the network um, and and you know just an explanation of the network was um, to be finished in October but we got it extended now, um, so we can spend all of our budget now oh, um, good yeah excellent and Francisca um, and Oriol uh, thanks special thanks really to Francisca because this was on very short notice um, uh, and and uh, yeah I think you deserve some sleep soon Francisca and uh, we hope to see you soon back in Europe okay all the best thank you Francisca <laughs>